and it's afternoon here in Lagos, Nigeria. So I'm saying good afternoon to everyone who has joined. We appreciate you taking time out. Even uh, when I was going through the chat room, I saw that aside from people from different parts of Nigeria, we have people who have joined in from North America and across Europe. And I know the time that might be like morning for you. So just taking that sacrifice to be here is something we appreciate. So this is the first um, public lecture for this year. And I'll just tell us a little bit about who we are and why we started the public lecture and what we're looking forward to having today. So this is put together by the Institute of Family Engineering and Development. And what we're just about is we're committed to promoting um, the dignity of persons through professional family life practice. Over the years, we've raised over 800 and counting family life practitioners who are using the family systems engineering approach across Africa and globally to help people reconnect to themselves, build effective systems that will first of all give them peace, give their immediate family peace, and then go on to promote the peace and dignity of peoples across the world. We're just from Nigeria, rising from the aftermath of our national elections, and there is a lot going on. But I said to my husband and some colleagues, our work is cut out for us as Nigerians, particularly for us who are in the family life space, because everything that has played out in the political scene, even with the masses in terms of the um, increasing apathy, bigotry and tribalism is just a reflection of who we are and stemming from how we were engineered, which starts from the family. And so that is why I'm particularly interested in today's topic. And I wish you are also interested where we'll be looking at how we can um, conduct research. Because for us as Africans, over the years, a lot of our proprietary solutions and even the things we can offer to humanity for Africa and across have been lost because we, we were not um, socialized to collect that data. We were not socialized to conduct research and we were not socialized to even put out what our findings are so that the world can know us better and the world can also know how to relate with us. That's why I am particularly excited over the work we've been doing at the Institute. And um, the main framework that we use, the Family Systems Engineering, was born out of indigenous research to say not that what we get from the Western world is not effective, but then we adapted it to the, to the African situation, interviewed people and looked at what was making families function well here, which I'm hoping that at the end of today's public lecture, we will glean more tools and skills that can help us. So why did we start the public lecture? The public lecture was started to provide professionals first in the family system, network of family systems um, practitioners, and also everyone who is involved in family life and is a stakeholder, government, the parastatals, the schools, the religious bodies, everyone who partakes in making family life better. We started this so that we can come together to discuss topical issues that impacts us as a people and impacts the work we do as family life and practitioners. So over the years, we have had different professionals come in and share ideas with us, which I know has improved the work we're doing in the Institute and even how we're relating to with our clients. So today I'm excited and um, happy that we're having somebody who is qualified to do this work. And um, in a moment, we'll be calling in up Professor Olujide Adekeye, who is of the Department of Psychology at the Covenant University of Ogun State, who will be leading the conversation on how to carry out family life research work. So if you're interested in this, and this is something that you want Africa 
to create solutions out of Africa for Africans and export it to the world, then research is very important because out there, people will not take you serious if you don't have data and if you don't have um, papers that show forth how your solutions has been working. One thing I want to share with us is um, a monumental um, experience we had when our founder, Praise for Warware, spoke at the Family Life Coaching Association conference in the US and presented data that we had collated from people who had taken the proprietary beliefs compatibility assessment. And that was when even professionals from outside of Africa looked at it and said, this is a solution because over there they've struggled with how to relate with African peculiar challenges in family life, but they saw one solution bettered by an African, supported with data and research, and that was how the Family Systems Engineering Certification course was purported to be, not just coaching, but a combination of coaching, strategy, and um, activation. So, on this note, I want to say you are welcome and you're in for something transformational. So get out your notebooks, be prepared, and enjoy this public lecture with us on how to carry out um, an important and transformative family life research. On that note, I say welcome, relax, and enjoy the experience. Back to you, Ebu. Thank you so much, Dima. That was, an, that was a beautiful one. Welcome once again. Um, now, without wasting much of our time, I will introduce our founder, Praise Fowe. Um, He's the one that will read the profile and introduce our guest. I yield the mic to you, um, Mr. Praise Fowe. Okay. Um... Thank you very much, Abulomo, and um, thank you, everyone. Welcome, Dima. That was such a lovely opening uh, remark, and um, I must say that I love um, your dress. Okay. <laughs> well, um, my job is very simple. I'm going to be bringing up a guest um, lecturer, and I want to believe that all of you guys are ready. Okay. Professor Olujide Adekeye is a professional counseling psychologist, lectures in the Department of Psychology, Covenant University he has his first and second degree from the prestigious University of Illinois. Professor Olujide Adeke was a part-time lecturer at the Institute of Education, University of Illinois, before he joined the services of Covenant University in 2004 and rose through the rank to become a professor on January 1st, 2018. His research interest revolves around health counseling with extensive publication on substance abuse, use and abuse, domestic violence, marital stability, and HIV and AIDS education. Other research areas include educational and career counseling, family and relationship counseling, and adolescent development. As part of his style and gown, Synergy is involved in the partnership of Covenant University with the Prison Fellowship of Nigeria and Smedem Tag, the Onesimus Project, where psychosocial, therapeutic, and rehabilitation training are rendered to inmates at the correctional centers in Kirikiri, Lagos. Professor Olujide Adeke has served as head Department of Psychology from August 2014 to 2016 as Director of Covenant University Counseling Center from October 2016 to August 2018. He is immediate past Dean of the College of Leadership and Development Studies, where he served from August 2019 to March 2022. Professor Adeke is currently serving as an executive member of the Global Partners in Education, representing Nigeria and Africa. Professor Adeke is an active member of the Association of Professional Counselors in Nigeria, Nigeria Psychological Association, Social Psychology Network, and a member of the Special Interest Group, Task Force on Indigenous Psychology, Division 32 for Humanistic Psychology of the American Psychological Association, among others. He's an alumnus of the Brown Institute Advanced Research Institute, Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island, USA. He has over 100 journal articles, monographs, and book chapters. He is the editor-in-chief of the Covenant International Journal of Psychology and member editorial boards of the Scientific Journal of Population Education 2021 to date, and the Covenant Journal of Entrepreneurship 2014 to 2021, among others. He also reviews for many reputable professional 
and academic journals in and outside um, Nigeria. Institute of Family Engineering and Development, please, let's give some love and let's make welcome to our Ms. Professor Olujide Adekeye. You're welcome, Prof. Thank you, Mr. Praise Fuwe, for the wonderful uh, intro. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, uh, let me try and see if I can easily share my screen before I continue with uh, the appreciation. Um, please, if you can see my slide, let me know. Am I on? Not yet, sir. Not yet, sir. Okay. Um, just a moment, please. Okay. Um, I will call somebody to help check with the system. Just a moment, please, sorry. Okay, uh, while we're waiting for the slides to come up, I wanna believe that we're all having a great time smiling from the aftermath of the Nigerian election and um, you know every other thing that happened. Um, like we have been discussing at the family Institute of Family Engineering Development, um, we believe that tribal bigotry has no place in modern society. So we want to, on behalf of the Institute, apologize to any group that has been a victim of um, tribal profiling during the last election. Um, it's not in our character, especially our Igbo brothers. It's never in our character. One of the things we, in fact, the most important thing we stand for at the Institute is the concept of humanity, Ubuntu, which says that I am because you are, there is no me without you. We never ever discuss religion or tribe or uh, profile it at the Institute. And um, that's why we believe that um, going forward, we need to push our ideology the more and begin to help people understand that there is nothing called, um, you know, this is my tribe, that is your tribe, um, because we have no say over those things. We were just born here and we found ourselves there. The only tribe that exists is humanity. And as we collapse the structures and the walls that separate humanity, then we can all collaborate together for a greater good. And so we apologize, um, you know, for those of you who are not part of the family life um, system yet, um, and you feel aggrieved, we say we are deeply sorry on behalf of the leadership of Nigeria, because if we wait for them to apologize, it may not come, right? So we stand and we say we apologize on their behalf. Okay, looks like um, Prof slide is coming up now. Um,
Can, can you see my slide now? Sorry. Yes, we can. We can see it, Prof, but it's not. Um, there are some um, stuff covering it. Is it possible it's sent to me um, so that I can I can I might be able to have it shared directly from here? Okay, I think um, you're almost there. So if you go to slideshow and just click on, can the cursor move to slideshow? Okay, good. It can. Um, yes, that's it. If you click on that. Yes, I think we're good. Okay. Again, good afternoon to you all. I'm, I'm sorry for taking some uh, time. I'm not used to this system. I just changed my system. Good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon, Prince Fuwe and your entire team. I'm glad to be invited to give this uh, lecture. But like I told you while we chatted the last time, in as much as uh, we might learn from this lecture, I'm equally open to learning from your organization. Um, I will try and explain as much as possible and then listen to comments, questions, or clarifications at the end of the lecture. Uh, research is extremely important, especially appreciating the dimension of your own organization dealing with family life. Family is extremely important, it's a basic unit, and we need to get it right at that point because whatever happens at the family end permits the society, the entire society. So conducting research on family life as an introduction is not an easy task I want to uh, submit because of the importance of the family to national development. Family life professionals must continue to conduct research to solve social issues or problems that the family often encounter, even as a social unit in all human societies. Conducting effective research that will bring meaningful findings needs a lot of work, particularly in the area of uh, literature search, in the area of research design, in the area of stating the research problem, and then the methodology and statistics involved and the overall execution of the research. Issues like birth, divorces, and marriages seem easy to observe and measure. But when we get to issues such as um, child abuse, marital happiness, instability, and some other fi fam family dynamics, then we get to the art part in terms of family research. So it's difficult to measure those ones objectively. Uh, at times, as researchers, our own values may affect us in terms of researching into issues of family, stability, divorces, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes studying electrons, microbes, or chemical reactions may even look easier as compared to studying about the family. However, as family life professionals, we are motivated to carry out effective, or what I say, quality research on families and children, because we want to promote and strengthen healthy family life. We want to as much as possible ameliorate the key stressors that affect families, that makes family life difficult and unfulfilling, and that bring about changes in the family. Thus, to achieve this purpose, we seek the most effective research approach to get the best and most objective information. Again, I want to thank you for inviting me, even as we go on, to look at this slide one after the other. The advancement of humanity is fueled by research. And of course, curiosity is what drives research. 
When we are curious, we ask questions. Without curiosity and inquiry, development will stall and life as we know it will be entirely different. We look at a culture of research and I've gone through your website and with the introduction by Dima, I know you do a lot of research. So we need a culture of research. We need to perpetuate a culture of research. A culture of research requires both institutional, organizational, and unit-based leaders to set clear research goals and communicate them effectively. Organizations wishing to develop a culture of research must allocate significant resources for training and support. Even before we carry out the actual research, we have to go undergo training support. So it needs some uh, resource allocation. Institutions and organizations may equally develop continuing education courses or support services in research practices, in grant writing, and of course, when you get a grant in grant management. And I know this will be the focus of the organization. You must have gotten grants, and then you need uh, more grants as you move ahead. Research, whether in the family research or in other facets of life, is basically the same or with some basic information. What we do is to understand the basic information that underpins research. Once we understand these basic processes, then we're able to, of course, diversify, use the research in different facets of life. The important thing is to understand the basics. Once we pick the basis, we get the basis, then of course. It's just like somebody who is uh, taught how to drive. Those days when we are taught how to drive manual, you start from gear one, but by the time you become a good driver, you can even move a car from gear two, as the case uh, may be. So we talk about research integrity. This is extremely important, especially in family life research because uh, some of the questions, some of the processes in family life research, permit me to use the term, may be invasive. You want to ask some personal deep questions from members of the family, from the husband or from the wife or for the children. And hence, we have to be extremely careful so as not to be accused of uh, unethical practices. So we talk about research integrity or code of conduct when we perform our research. So integrity in research is fundamental to the advancement of knowledge for the public support of research and of course for the autonomy of the academic uh, profession. I've put some um, research integrity some research integrity, um, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, about six. We have more, these, are, these are not exhaustive. We have more than this, but for the purpose of this research, we can just look at all of these, pick them and read about the Singapore statement. Even Nigeria, we have the National Code of Health Research Ethics, uh, the Montreal Statement, the Amsterdam Agenda, the Hong Kong Principles on Research Integrity, and of course, of course, the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity. Like I mentioned, these are not exhaustive, but these are important to start with. This will give us the background knowledge we need so as not to uh, bring about any accusation of unethical practice in our conduct or in our research uh, processes. This is extremely important. Now we start, before you undergo a research, you, you, you might want to think about the question or the problem. So what's the research question? Or what's the research problem? Why am I going into this? Why do I want to research this? Why do I want to study this? Why do I want to explore this? So once we begin to think, what is the research question? A research question is a question that is studied or a research project aims to answer. 
So whatever is the focus of the research is a research question, and that will form the fulcrum. Whatever you do is based on that research problem or the research question, which of course addresses an issue or a problem through which you now collect data, you do your analysis and you interpret data. And then we have your discussion, conclusion, you pick the lessons from the data so gathered. Doing family research or doing research on families, we may want to look at exploration. We don't want to explore some areas of family research. I want to describe certain issues or trends that has been observed, or we need some explanation on some happenings, or we want to predict. But when we do explanation, we are tending towards experimental research. We want to do experimental research so as to be able to explain some phenomenon in the family setup, or we want to predict, looking at single parentage, we want to predict children from such homes, children who have uh, their mothers and fathers, et cetera, et cetera. Or we might want to do intervention studies. You have observed a case or observed a challenge prevalent in a particular area of family or ethnicity. You might want to do intervention studies to see how we can help uh, reduce or mitigate such issues. And of course, evaluation, assessing some things and then reappraising to be able to understand uh, better. So is research on families different? I mentioned in my introduction that this is the basic unit. So families are systems of individuals, different individuals coming together to form families, different individuals with varying personality. And we know what personality means. That is some total of an individual's disposition. The sum total of an individual's disposition. Disposition varies from person A to person B to person C. We see the same thing, but the way we analyze the same thing differs. So we are bringing in different set of individuals with different varying personalities. And then today, the definition of family is evolving. Uh, maybe at the end of the lecture, uh, Mr. Praise may want to help out in terms of defining family. Uh, the traditional definition of family is changing gradually. What we were taught while we were young, I think is changing. The Nigerian society may be the society that wouldn't uh, want to recognize that things are changing. But in the Western world, it's become a culture or a part of their culture. Uh, a family could be a man and another man staying together or a woman and another woman. But in Nigeria, because of our culture and of course because of our religious orientation, um, we are still stick, uh, sticking to the old, um, why well, don't let me use the term old, to the traditional definition of the family as consisting of the father, the mother, their child or their children. But the definition of families evolving gradually, just like gender. You feel some forms, you ask your gender, male, female, I don't want to disclose, et cetera, et cetera. So things are changing gradually. Then we equally have multiple statuses, not just about economic or socioeconomic status. We have single parentage, we have uh, monogamous marriages. We equally have Syria monogamous families, apart from the polygamous family. So we have multiple statuses. When we want to do research on family, we have to consider all of these variables or dynamics so that to prepare us for what we meet in the field. There are several variables of interest when we do research, especially family research. Uh, I know persons have uh, difficulty uh, differentiating between dependent variables, independent variables, to start with, even before going on to the simple causal model. 
this talking about diagrams that link things together. For those who have had uh, papers on uh, path analysis, you want to understand better what I'm talking about, a uh, causal model. Let's leave that apart and look at dependent and independent variables. You, you bring a research topic out, it's difficult for persons to pick out which is a dependent variable or variables and which are or is a dependent, independent variable or variables. This area needs, we have to be careful in this area so that uh, our analysis will be correct. Uh, an expert who sees a form of analysis, but who sees that you are mixing dependent for independent may outrightly just take out the paper as having uh, issues. So we look at dependent variables, which is a type of variable that you don't manipulate, you don't change, it's just there. It's dependent on some other factors. For example, we are looking at um, instability at home. We can pick instability at home, marriage instability or family instability as a dependent variable, and then search for some independent variables. Those ones you can manipulate, those ones you can change to see the effect on the dependent variable. For example, how much the husband loves the wife and vice versa, how much they communicate at home. Influence of third parties, maybe in-laws, friends, uh, co-workers, even clergy. We want to look at all of those independent variables. They are the ones you can manipulate. If we feel it's the influence of the third party that's bringing about the instability, you can do away with the third party. So that is why we say independent variables can be manipulated, can be changed, can be dealt with, you can manipulate it. But for the dependent variable, it remains. It's dependent on whatever happens to the other independent variables. And then we have some intervening or mediating variables that may bring about some issues even as we undergo our research. These include maybe our own parental rearing style, what we grew up to understand as a perfect uh, way of uh, dealing with our children from our own personal experience. We might look at level of education. Um, level of education might be an intervening variable, somebody who is well educated and somebody who is uh, not well educated in quotes. We can equally look at the back order. We have the first born, we have the last born, we have the only child, all of these variables may affect what we do. So we call them intervening or mediating variable. Our religious inclination may also be a point. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, our personality may equally affect uh, the research we are undergoing part time. So all of these variables are important to do a good family research. Yes, we do literature search. When you have a challenge, you have, okay, you have a problem at hand, a family problem at hand, uh, it might be advisable to do a literature search. Let's see what others have done in that area. Because we believe there is no entirely a new thing under the heavens, under the heavens, something close might have happened to somebody. It may not be exactly the same scenario, but something close that you can make inference from that. So we want to do a literature search, but I've come to understand that most people don't do thorough literature search or what we call systematic review. You just pick a paper because the title looks close or closer to what you are trying to do, you pick it up and you want to use it. No, all of these points will help a good literature search, especially starting from the fourth point here. Looking at the abstract, you might not be, you might not care about the institutional affiliation. Some do, they want to see the university or the research outfit that published the paper, or is it a known author? For example, if you see anything from, I'm not, um, um, well, let me, let me leave that part. If you see a good book from a good author, you might want to 
look, look at it. I, I was going to say I'm not patronizing uh, praise for Wewe, but if I see something written by him, uh, it's likely I want to look at it to pick uh, lessons from it. But we look at the abstract. We believe often the abstract should summarize the study. So from the background to the method that was used to the key findings, and of course, the conclusion. Those are the basic four parts to any good uh, abstract. So I want to look at the abstracts. If you feel there are parameters that suit your work, you go on to looking at the introduction. You read the literature in that uh, material. Look at how data was gathered, even the research design that's talking about the methods now, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we, as researchers, we don't have the time to go through these. So I want to ad advocate that we take our time to go through any material we feel may be relevant to the study. Let's take our time to look at the sample, the method, the measurement. I'll still come to measurement, which is extremely important, and then some other procedures. I believe a good research, we should be able to replicate a good research. So all of this will help you to know, okay, so that you don't reinvent the wheel, you pick from that knowledge and then you can uh, move on to conducting your own research. So it's good we don't rush to collecting data. Let's look at literature. Let's see what others have done in that area. And that will guide our own study. Extremely important. Aha, measurements. Measurement is uh, one area that most of our researchers have issues. Uh, and I will try as much as possible to explain what measurement means and how it impacts our research. When we hear measurement, we, okay, we know it's about assigning numbers. We can't again say that. To carry out any research, as the case may be, we must assign numbers to our variables. It deals with assigning numbers to our variables, but not just assigning numbers, we assign it in a meaningful way. So understanding measurement skills is extremely important. Oftentimes when we do our studies, we look at skills. I was going to say standardized skills, but some skills are not standardized. But my admonition is to use standardized skills. When we have standardized skills, we, we, we can equally do the reliability test to see how suitable that skill is to our own immediate environment. Most of the skills, like Dima said, we, we import from the West because uh, we, can't, we don't often sit down to follow the rigors to getting our scale out. It's extremely di difficult. You need experts to even help you in terms of doing the validity tests and reliability tests before a scale could be acceptable or usable as the case may be. But I will try as much as possible to just introduce us to these measurement levels so as to help us as we create our own skills. You see most skills, they come with the like it type scale, strongly agree, agree, strongly disagree, or things around that. Or we see some that says, this is more of me, this is less of me. Or some scales we say from zero to 10, or from one to 10, one means, or meaning the least, and 10 meaning the most, that you want to pick from that area. All of these, are uh, scaling. But what we are used to is just to see uh, the questionnaire or the scale and then just administer to others without understanding what has gone in before that scale uh, was uh, produced. So measurement is extremely important and we need to understand, especially the four levels of measurement. There are four levels of measurement. And I use the acronym NO. N-O-I-R, which means black in French, to differentiate, to understand the four. The nomina, that is for N. O is ordinal, 
and I is interval, and then R is ratio. So this is the basic four scales that we have. And each of these four scales provides different information. Each of these four scales provide excuse me, different information. And we'll see that as we progress in this uh, lecture. When gathering data, we collect different types of information, depending on what we hope to investigate or to find out. For example, um, we might do a study trying to find out how families spend their money in Lagos or in Lagos State, so to say. How families spend their money or habits of families in Lagos State. We might send out a survey to say a thousand people asking questions about their income, about their gender, about their age, about the exact location where they are living. Because when we do a study in Lagos, we have different locations. What's some variables that might be peculiar to person staying on the island, say Ikoyi Leki, might be different from person staying in um, Ajegunle or Oshudi area. So all of these are variables we must consider in our research or else, our analysis will be skewed. We might not know that, but experts will go through our research. We know there's something wrong with this research and it will not be nice for our researches to be turned back. So like I mentioned, there are four measurements, uh, levels of measurements, nomina, ordina, interval, and ratio. And I will just look at some of the features of each of these. Okay, nominal scale is the, is the weakest, I use that term, of the four scales, is, is the simplest and the weakest. Because nominal scale is simply for identification or for categorization. I mentioned gender the last time. Gender could just be male or female. You can categorize that as one or two. Male one, female two. That's nominal scale. So anybody that sees two, you know, okay, you're talking about the female. Even when you want to input your, you want to code into a statistical tools, you tell the system one means male, two means female. So it's simply for identification purposes. Uh, let's look at football. I'm a football fan. A, a player wearing number 28 and another player wearing number 14. The number of their jersey is simply for identification purposes. It's not that uh, the person wearing number 28 is two times better than the player wearing number 14. This scale does not have the power to say that. It's just for identification for categorization sake. Another scale may have the power to say, okay, 28 is two times of 14. And we're able to use that 28 is two times of 14 or 28 has two times the property of 14. But for nominal scale, you can't say that. It's just for identification. Number 28 is a player called this. Number 14 is a player called this. So that's that about the nominal scale. Okay, before I leave that, let me, for women, let me use the air color. Air color, gray, blonde, black, white, you can attach numbers to them, one, two, three, four. It doesn't mean number four is two times better than number two. It's just to identify. Okay, color one, we're talking about blonde color. Okay, color three, we're talking about the black M. Those are just for identification uh, purposes. It doesn't convey much uh, meaning. We go on to ordinary scale. From the term ordinary, we can order. We can rank. That is what that scale does. It deals with magnitude. This with magnitude. This with positioning. So I might want to say, okay, um, in a family, uh, we have three children. I have the right to say the first born, the second born, and the third born. But you know what? I might not be able to talk about equal interval. I might not be able to say 
between the firstborn and the secondborn, four years, and there must equally be four years between the second and the thirdborn. No. What I just know that is person A is the firstborn, person B is the secondborn, uh, child C is the thirdborn. That is about magnitude or position in class. A child took first, another one second, another one third. You might want to measure the distance between number one and number two. The first position might be 97 over 100. The second position might be 96.5 over 100. The third position might be 70 over 100. So there is no equal interval. It's just to rank order or to position some things. So that's why we say it deals with magnitude. We can equally look at income. We can say low income, middle income, and high income family. Another ordinary scale that we can use is education. No education, primary education, secondary education, tertiary education. You can even subdivide tertiary education into the college of education, the polytechnic, the university. And then you can go ahead to say a second degree and then a third degree. So that's that about ordinary scale. But may I mention here that as the scale moves higher, the preceding scale has all of the properties of the other scale. So nominal scale is the weakest, but ordinary scale has a property of the nominal scale in addition to its, to its own uh, parameter of being measuring magnitude. So we go on to the third scale, and that is the interval scale. Like you see in front, the interval scale deals with equal interval. It has that property of nominal scale as a property of ordinal scale. Can identify, can rank other, can position, but it's quality as what you call equal interval. The only thing the inter interval, um, interval scale does not have is absolute zero. So we want to look at uh, uh, measuring temperature in Fahrenheit. That is an example of an interval scale. Measuring temperature in Fahrenheit is example of uh, interval scale. You can say the difference between 10 and 20 degrees is the same thing as the difference between 50 and 60 degrees. You have the right to say that under this type of measurement. And then the last one is the ratio. Is a ratio measurement, which of course incorporates the first three, apart from its own uh, parameter of uh, having what we call absolute zero. So we can look at, uh, let me pick a paper. We can look at the paper, these are sticky notes, as not having any weight. That is zero. None of the other three could do that, but the ratio scale could do that. It has a property of absolute zero. Talking about kilometer, et cetera, kilogram, you can weigh something, something may not have any weight. That is what we use. The scales of measurement are important because they determine the type of statistics you are going to use. That is the trick. When we submit papers to journals, those editors, that's what they check. How did you measure your data and which statistics are you using? We get to that place where we talk about inferential statistics. Your measurement skill determines at the end of the day, the statistics you're gonna use. So it's extremely, extremely important. I'm sorry, please permit me. Thank you. Now let's look at H. Though um, I'm not sure the setup of the system, or maybe it's just, uh, I may not be expecting a response from you, but this is just to make us uh, uh, think aloud. Uh, where can we categorize H? Is H nomina or ordinary? Uh, this is just a, a, a probing question, so to say, to show us that there may be some, um, some over, over, overlaps in terms of our uh, measurement scale. Age is an example, and it's dependent on how the question is asked. 
and we see that in the other slide. It's dependent on how the question is asked. For example, uh, if I have five persons, I'm asking of their ages, 10, 15, 17, that is simply nominal. It's just to identify, okay, uh, person A is 17 years old, person B is 10 years old, it's nominal. But when I take the question further, to now ask, okay, what is your position? This is your age, you are 17, but what is your position in the family? Then I'm moving towards some form of ordering. I'm moving towards some form of ranking, and that is ordinal. So age can be both nominal and ordinal data, depending on the question types, depending on the question we ask. For example, how old are you? Is used to collect nominal data. But when you, are, when you pull it uh, forward, you say, okay, you are 70, you are 10, are you the first one? Or what is your position? That's talking about the back order. What's the position in your family? Then we have transited to uh, ordinary uh, stage or ordinary data as the case may be. So age becomes ordinary when there's some sort of order attached to it, when there's some form of order attached to it. Now we, we talked about the dependent and independent variables. In studies, we equally look at whether the study is quantitative, uh, making use of uh, figures, numbers, to arrive at a conclusion, or qualitative, which deals mostly with discussion, as opposed to quantitative method uh, for family research. I'm not going to advocate that one is better than the other. There have been, there have been arguments about the fact that qualitative methods might better suit family studies because you can go to the participants, ask questions, uh, elaborate questions, you get more, more understanding of the prevailing issue. But in as much as that is uh, desirable, quantitative method is equally good. Here you want to talk with confidence, you want to talk with data. When you have quantitative method, you have your data, you can do qualitative method to back up your data. Qualitative method will back up what we have gotten from the numbers, may help us um, make our findings more robust in terms of a quantitative uh, method. So how do we get uh, quantitative uh, data? It's through experimentation, whether it's a real experiment or quasi-experiment as the case may be. It may be true survey method, that is a interview, whether phone interview or one-on-one, -on -one interview, it may be true distribution of a survey questionnaire or whatever method we want to use is survey. And then true observation. And when we use observation for a family study, we prefer unobtrusive observation or what we call non-invasive observation or non-reactive observation. That is, you want to observe the family in a natural setting. Once the participants are aware that they are being observed, it, it's likely they want to hide under some social facade or, or manipulate their behavior. But you have to observe through unobtrusive means. The participants must not be aware that they are being observed. Although, of course, you don't have to go to their various homes, but whether in natural settings, in the worship centers, in the amusement center, wherever, bus stop, in the offices, wherever you can observe and then uh, record your observation, that may equally help with anecdotal records, et cetera, et cetera. So we have the quantitative method, which some people feel it's uh, difficult, but uh, I, I prefer the quantitative method. Then we have the qualitative method. These are used to gather information directly from participants or stakeholders, as the case may be, about the issue or what matters to them. 
And this often sets the stage for understanding quantitative results. It helps to understand quantitative results and to pinpoint variables crucial for future investigation. So we have different types. It may be case studies. It may be ethnography. We all know what ethnography means. That is a, a type of qualitative uh, research where we like to immerse ourselves with our participants to stay with them, to understand their idiosyncrasies. So this is difficult, it will be time consuming, but that is what ethnography uh, has to do uh, with. You immerse yourself with your population of interest. You may even stay with them to understand their behavior and their idiosyncrasies. Then we have the time diary method. Uh, this is extremely uh, funny. That means you have to record whatever you do from your waking time to your sleeping time. So you want to look at uh, your activity, which activity per time, the duration, how long did you spend on the activity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we have the focus groups, focus group discussion. Um, and th those are examples of qualitative method. You get more information, you get robust information because all of the questions are open. You know, in the survey method, when you want to pick quantitative uh, data, you might want to restrict yourself to closed questions. That, that's what to say, you can't use open questions, but you might want to restrict yourself to closed questions to be able to regulate the flow of information for analysis uh, sake. I mentioned that um, I'm not in this lecture to say, okay, this is the better of the two methods. So rather I will advocate for what we call the mixed method, the mixed method. So what you do is use both qualitative and the quantitative method to give you more robust uh, finding, more robust findings. So I rather advocate the mixed method. You do your survey, you pick quantitative data and then mix it up with qualitative uh, data. Another important area in research, especially in family research, is uh, ethics. Recall I gave you about six uh, ethical standard uh, protocols, uh, how that's the name, protocols that you can go through. I'm happy we probably have in Nigeria that deals with uh, how we deal with humans and animals. Ethics is especially important. In fact, some um, publishing outfits will not consider your paper without a session on ethical consideration. So it's especially important that we look at ethics, even as we conduct our studies. So ethics deals with the standard of behavior that tells us what we ought to do in our personal and professional lives. It deals with standard of conduct or morality. Standard of conduct, code of conduct, or morality. There are practices that encourage shortcuts and misdemeanor. Some are intentional, uh, some are not intentional, maybe due to lack of experience or some other um, errors of uh, omission. So we want to look at being transparent, being sincere, being truthful, being open in terms of our research. You have to be transparent. You don't call white, white, call black, black to your participants. Don't hide under any facade in order to get information from your participants. That may not be too good. So let's look at morality, even as we conduct uh, family research or any other, any form of research as the case may be. We need to consider ethics, ethical behavior. This is especially important to our practice in the family life uh, research space. Some ethical considerations include looking at intellectual property. We might see a good skill to get some points out, wonderful skill that relates to issues happening in the family that you are working with. 
but we want, want to consider the intellectual property, the proprietary rights. Do you have to take permission from the source, from the owner, or from the publisher? You might want to check that out before using the scale. Did, 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 did you seek for informed consent from your participants? You are just batting on them and getting the information to use? Do you show respect? Do, do you even plan to debrief your participants, that is to take the results of your inquiry or of your analysis back to your participants? Conflict of interest. A wife, for example, tells you she cheated the husband, but because somehow you know somebody who knows the husband, you want to get information to the husband, bridging confidentiality and privacy rights of your participants. This you can be sued for. So confidentiality is simply keeping another person's secret as secret, not diverging other, the other party's information. But I might want to sound a note of caution here. Confidentiality itself is not, um, which term now? It's not absolute. Okay, that's the term. It's not absolute. You have a family member come to you and says, as I leave your office now, I'm going to hurt my partner. I'm going to kill my partner. And because you want to uphold the tenet of confidentiality, then you want to keep this information to yourself. That is wrong. So it's not absolute. At times, we might have to divulge the information to the right source, the right third party, like the law enforcement agents or agencies, as the case may be. So confidentiality, in as much as it's good, is an ethical behavior. It's not absolute. There are conditions when we have to breach confidentiality to save life. Anything that will hurt the person or another member of the society, we have to do something about it. Then we have to be honest, I've mentioned this, objective, and of course, prudent. All of these are not exhaustive. They are part of ethical constitutions to have a good research. Most of these protocols, ethical protocols, we talk about this. I just clean this and then I'll read it out for us. Ethical guidelines as pursuit of truth. The truth, the old truth, are nothing but the truth. We're not in the law court, though. I don't mean. The truth, be honest about your research. The old truth, omission of part of research findings might constitute research misconduct. It's a form of misdemeanor. It's a form of malpractice that violates other moral norms. Nothing but the truth. It's also dishonest to puff up one's results, to, to embellish it, to enrich, to add irrelevant data, or just to add, um, uh, what time will I use now? Just, just things that flew into our head, which was not part of the actual results from our analysis, whether from quantitative or, or from qualitative study, just to embellish our results. That is wrong. That is a misdemeanor or misleading information or overstating the significance of your results. We have to be extremely careful of all of this. We have to be extremely careful of all of these points. So we have to deal with the truth, the old truth, and nothing but the truth. I'll quickly run to data collection. Uh, Dima, please, when I have 10 minutes left, could you kindly tell me? Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, what is data collection? We have talked about some processes. I started my lecture based on this, that there are some basics. And once we understand those basics, then it will help in the conduct of our research. So let's get to this point when we have started the study. We have gotten the research problem. We've been able to run through the research questions and or hypotheses or propositions as the case may be when we want to collect data. What is it about data collection? Data 
for definition's sake, data is any kind of information that you have that has been formatted in a particular way, any way that is usable for you. That is data. Any kind of information that you're able to format in a way that suits you, that suits your research purpose is data. Therefore, data collection is the process of gathering, measuring, analyzing, not just data, you can see the term there, that's a qualifier, accurate data from different sources, from a variety of relevant sources to find answers to our research statement of problems, and forecast trends and probabilities. Sorry, please. Thank you. So we look at sources of data. There are two main, this is not exhaustive though, but most of the other sources could be uh, classified under these two primary uh, sources of data. Two sources, primary data and secondary data. The one you go out to collect by yourself via the use of questionnaire, one-on-one -on -one interview is primary data. The one you rely on that has already been collected, maybe in the library, uh, published article, those are secondary data from the newspaper, from the magazine. You are talking of census figures, uh, national demographic and health uh, data. All of those are secondary data, not things you collected by yourself. That's why it's called secondary data. So most sources are either primary or secondary data. I've explained this because of my time. Still explaining primary data because that's the most important one. Yes, we can embellish our primary data by secondary data, but it's good to get hands on primary data. Sources of uh, collecting data, there are different sources of collecting our data. It may be survey, um, focus group, or in depth interview telephone interview, interview, use of questionnaires, whether it's offline or online, door-to-door -door survey, like it's done in census, they are planning on that one very soon, via observation, uh, personal interview, or through experimentation. Let's note that no one method is the best method. Sorry, I just wanted to request for water. No one best, no one best method. There's no best method. Depending on what you are conversant with or what you can play with, what is convenient for you. But there are some things we need to look at. Our decision may have to depend on what we need to know. Stories, numbers, where the data resides. Is it in a file? I have, do you have to talk to people? Or is the data in our environment, immediate environment? The resources we need and the time we need, how complex the data is to be collected, uh, frequency of the data collection, and intended forms of data analysis. That's another wonderful area, data analysis. All of these are decisions to be made before we collect our data. Rules for collecting data. It's good that we use multiple data collection methods. And if you are using, especially the secondary uh, source, we need to know the following. How the measures were defined, how the data were collected, how they were cleaned. We need to clean our data, extent of missing data, and the accuracy of the data. How did the users ensure accuracy of the data? We need to find out some of these points before we might decide to use the secondary data. But a way out is triangulation. This helps to increase the accuracy and the effectiveness of the data we have gathered. Triangulation of method we use 
we can collect same information using different methods, same information using variety of sources, same information picking from one evaluator. For those who have um, gone to the embassy for interviews, some of the things you have filled in, you have submitted uh, the visa officer, he has the information with him, but he might want, still want to ask you, he's trying to get the same information from another source. You have sent written, or you have filled the form, you have given him the information, number of children, when you met uh, your wife, how long you've been married, he might equally want to ask questions. And as he's asking questions, he's confirming with what you have filled in. So he's trying to ensure the accuracy of the data you have supplied, whether it's correct or not uh, correct or reliable as the case may be. Sorry, Prof. Yes, half time minutes left. Um, actually like six minutes now. Okay, let, let me just rush this. Thank for, you. For our statistics, often we have to seek the help of experts. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it yourself. If you have uh, the, um, why not? If you understand how to do statistics, you can go ahead and do your statistics. The descriptive is the simpler of this. Inferential statistics is more difficult when you want to look at um, parametric and non-parametric tests. That's where you have the regressions of this world, whether it's multiple regression, linear regression. Um, you have the T-test, the Z-test, the ANOVA, that is one way, uh, two way. Uh, maneuver those those are complex statistics that you might want to get an expert once you have your data you, you can want to, you can get an expert to help you uh, fulfill this area of your research without doing the analysis the statistics you can't do much so descriptive these are when you see a study and you say okay um age you see the data on age on gender how many male how many female uh, level of education, primary, those are descriptive data, just to describe the, uh, the your participants, their social demographic data or information as the case may be. But for influential, we need much more deep statistics that experts could help uh, do. So let me move away from all of these influential um, statistics. It's good because we make inferences and that's the basis of uh, of, of uh, data, you have something you want to make inference. You have your sample because you can't look at the whole population. You have your sample, whatever you get from that sample, you should be able to apply to the whole population. That what you get from your sample applies to the whole population. That is where inferential statistics come in. So this is the process of inferential statistics. You have, you have your sample, which should be representative. You collected the data. You do analysis, and from that, we make conclusions and inferences about the whole population. Let's just move ahead. Okay, um, how do you communicate uh, research? I'm not too sure how the Institute for Family Engineering and Development uh, does their own communication, but there are different ways. You pick uh, data from the community. You might want to go back to the community to deprive them. That's okay, sometimes they go, we got this data, and this is the result of our analysis. Uh, we want to put number one point, number two point, number three point, and some other implication of the study. Uh, that's one way of communicating your research finding. You might want to publish in journals. Uh, you might want to do a monograph or publish in the newspapers or magazines that relates to your area, family life studies. You want to organize workshops, seminars to disseminate your finding maybe on a trending topic, like um, uh, the, the current increase in the rate of divorce, not in, not in the world, in Nigeria. The rate of increase of divorce, it's, it's alarming. So, or you may want to include your contact, you may want your participant to include their contact details at the end of the survey, so that you can send the results of the analysis to them or use some other social media platform, whatever works for you. That's how you communicate your research findings. In some of my own clusters here, we organize uh, uh, workshops and seminars in the local community to give back to them. 
and we took this data from you, and this is the result, how to get better implication of this finding, et cetera, et cetera. Conclusion, research can be cumbersome, whether in family life studies or in other area of endeavor. It can be cumbersome, but understanding the basics will help to make it an enjoyable venture. When it comes to scaling, when it comes to levels of measurement, we might not have this, uh, we have special persons, the uh, persons who have um, expertise in the area of uh, psychometrics. We have experts in that area, statistics that can help us do all of this. Let's just do our write-up, get the analysis and then explain the results. This seminar did not cover all parameters, I must confess. There are other parts that have left because one, time constraint. Some other experts may want to look at the gaps going forward. I want to appreciate um, Mr. Praise for who we for the invite and your entire team uh, for this initiative. I want to recognize members of my own professional association, APROCON, professional, Association of Professional Counselors in Nigeria. I want to appreciate my family. I'm, my wife is on the platform. Some of my friends and colleagues here in Covenant University are on the platform. Thank you all for this opportunity. It's been a wonderful time talking to you. Again, I appreciate you all. Wow, thank you so much, Professor Olujide Adeke. That was an amazing one. That's very educative and very enriching um, presentation there. And um, people in the house, can you please go into the chat box and appreciate Professor Olujide Adeke? I'm sure you will agree with me that to be a professor it's not my mind. You can see all the explanation and all. And um, when his bio was read the other time, he said he has more than a hundred papers. So going through all these and writing papers, uh, I think we need to celebrate him. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, it's, it's an amazing one. Thank you so much. I, I just want to run through some of the things Prof mentioned when he was taking us through the lecture. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 I believe you can see in the chat box. The chat box is buzzing. People saying thank you. They truly appreciate you. Um, Prof mentioned while he was rounding up that research can be cumbersome, but understanding the basics helps us to um, enjoy it. And it's just the truth. With all the grammar and everything he has been talking about, you might be thinking, oh God, wow, this is a lot. But the truth is, if you understand the basics, and these are the things he has explained to us, if you understand it, it can be enjoyable and you can make it enjoyable. You don't have to be the one to do the analysis. Like he said, we have people that are that does that, you know, we can employ those service. You just go ahead, do your um, write-ups, interview people know your research question. You know, when he started, he talked about um, being curious. And of course, it is curiosity that is making us ask all those questions that want us to know and understand some of those things that we need to know. And he said, a culture of research is very important. There's a need for resources to carry out research. Very important resources, very important. You want to you want to draw a questionnaire, you need money, you want to go to the village to find out what's happening amongst the villagers and all, you know. Um, there is a need for resources. Integrity is very important. You need to understand your why. Why do you want to do this research? And that is where we have the research question and identifying what the problem is. You identify the problem. Why do you want to go about it? What is the question you need to ask? Um, your research question is your focus, and um, it forms the re research problem, forms the fulcrum that helps you to navigate around. Prof talked about um, uh, the different forms, exploration, explanation, description, prediction, 
an evaluation. And because we know the specialty or the peculiarity of the family life area sector, there's a need to understand why you need to carry out. You know, when we started, I said something about the family as is the production factory of the society. So the, if you understand what's going on in the family, then you're able to solve the problem all this bigotry we are talking about. We'll be, we're able to solve the problem because you know where the people are coming from. You're able to research. You're able to look at the variables you want to work with. He talked about considering the dynamics and the variables you're working with, where he mentioned the dependent variable, intervening variable, and the independent variable. Then he talked about going to check other people's work to form your basis. You don't have to copy them but see what they have done, what gap have they covered, which gap are they, are they leaving open? And in saying that, he, said, he mentioned some inferences you need to take note of, and then he moved into measurements. Measurement is very important. That's where the statistics comes in. He talked about the method. Is it qualitative method you want to use or quantitative method? And he went into talking about the confidentiality, which is very important. And he also said, as much as you're promising your clients or your respondents, you're promising them confidentiality, you need to also know that it is not absolute. You need to know that if it is going to cause them harm, then you need to, you need to divulge whatever information that you have in that direction. And he talked about ethical consideration. Right now, I, I know that in universities, you have to do ethical review then you will now do plagiarism checking and all that, you know, just to ensure that you are carrying out this research within the ethical, uh, you're considering the ethics of whatever field you're carrying out the research from. And he talked about honesty. And that's where he talked about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Don't try to embellish any results. Don't try to manipulate. We know people do it, but don't try to manipulate. Let's see what your research is actually giving you. And by the time you're true to it, even at that point, at that time you're carrying out the research, if it's not really showing it, at the long run, you, your results will eventually show. And in fact, they may have to refer to your own work to say, do you remember this person said this? And we were kind of trying to doubt, ensure that, when you are carrying out your research, you must do it in all honesty. Then the data collection, he talked about communicating your findings. For us, we do, we, we, we do conference, we host conference, we do community infusion, we do newspaper, and you know, we do all that. We also want to venture into writing papers now, which is going to also help us. And um, that's one of the reasons why we're doing this. Um, so we need to watch all those areas if we want to carry out research. Thank you very much, um, Professor Olujide Adekeye. We want to go into um, the question and answer section. I believe we have people in the house that want to ask questions. Kindly drop your questions in the chat box. If you have questions, while I hand over this session to Mr. Praise for Wuwe. Thank you, PF. I yield the mic to you, sir. Thank you very much, Ebolomo. Um, thank you very much, Pro, for making um, a very, a topic that is considered very boring. Um, you made it very, very interesting. Um, I mean, I know that a lot of people will run away when they succumb to a class um, to come and learn about research because it's usually very, very boring. I mean, the way you handle the topic, I feel like coming to enroll in your department so that you can be my lecturer. Um, that's the way I feel because you, you, your students must be very lucky to have someone like you. Uh, it's one thing to have knowledge. It's another thing to be able to pass it. I think you passed it very accurately and then um, you made it very, very easy and then uh, made it very enjoyable. Now, I... If you have a question, please drop your question in the chat box. I'm going to respond to it, but I'm going to start with um, some of the questions I have here. Um, Prof, we, we know that a lot of research has been done, um, but it's one thing to do research, it's another thing to act on the recommendation of the research. So if you look at, um, I mean, because I function in the US at the moment, 
um, covering North America, um, there's been a lot of research on divorce. But the divorce rates in the US, I mean, with every research, it keeps going up. And I know that Nigeria, I mean, Nigeria doesn't really have enough data, um, but I know the divorce rate in Nigeria is very, very high. So my question is, why as research recommendation across the globe, why hasn't it translated to a reduction, you know, in, in divorce rates or um, why hasn't, um, haven't they been able to solve the problem? I mean, since we all know the problem, why haven't those, it, it, would you say that the policymakers have not been able to do the right things or what in your opinion is the reason why um, research um recommendation hasn't translated to a change in behavior or um resolving the real issues while the research was done okay thank you for that uh question acting on recommendations of research yes several researches on several researches but on this particular issue of divorce especially in the u.s i mentioned it's i and in Nigeria, like you've uh, averted to, it's equally high. But the truth remains, when you have your research, you have your results, it depends on the number of persons who are able to go through this. It depends on intentionality. Some persons, no matter what the research says, if they are bent on leaving the home, leaving the relationship, nobody can stop them. Then um, as, as researchers, most of our, I talked about disseminating research information. Uh, we have therapists, we have counselors, we have psychologists. These are the experts that often make use of the research findings. Because mm -hmm. the other couple outside may not even uh, go to the net to research on why, is this happening at home? Let me Google it. Let me see what even the trend outside. Is this limited to my family or is it trending thing? And from there, they pick some knowledge that may help to resolve the issue at hand. But like you said, policymakers, yes, in terms of uh, divorce in some other areas of research, they, they make do, especially in the Western world. In, in Nigeria, our average senator. Eh? I'm sorry, I wouldn't know those on this platform, so let me do that for another time. But we don't, we don't read. How I many of them consult uh, journals? Do they have uh, PAs or SAs on these areas? But how I many of them do read to know what's even going on part time to influence positively uh, policy formulation? Then again, in our culture, uh, divorce rates is on the high side. Our clergy, let me be silent about this, they've not helped matters, mm. whether in Islamic religion or in Christianity. Our clergy have not helped matters. Uh, in, in the Western world, you want to corroborate that issues, they run to the therapists, yeah. the family counselors. But here, instead of seeking therapy, the first point is my pastor. What I'm saying, what I'm, I'm not saying spiritual intervention is bad. No. I'm a Christian, I teach in a Christian university, but you, you don't just say the place of therapy, the place of psychological intervention. So it's not about um, people not acting on the recommendation. I believe experts, because that's my area. And I know colleagues in Covenant University, you have to read, look at what has been published in that area to be able to expand your own horizon so that when you discuss with persons, with issues in family, children having issues at home, husband, wife, uh -huh. you are able to talk from evidence-based platform. You have the results, and then you're able to help them resolve issues. So I think I only admonish uh, our counselors, our therapists, our professionals to search more, get more information to expand the horizon so that they can help in whatever way, not just uh, for divorce, but they can help in several other uh, ways to intervene in family issues. So that is, that is it, sir. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, and um, that takes me to my, my next question, because I, I sometimes look at the quality of decision making or approach to issues in Nigeria and Africa generally. And I keep asking, what is the place of root cause analysis 
when something happens. I'll give you an example. Um, so everybody knows about the um, um, Chris Land case that was trending, right? A child died. Then the first response from government is close down the school. Now, I know that in America that will not happen. Yeah, um, even when there is a terrorist attack in the school, they don't close down the school for like a week or something like that, right? Um, so it looks to me like we are always about banning. Let's ban it. Let's do this. Let's do that. Nobody's, I mean, I was doing a bit of root cause analysis and I was asking, the event took place in a stadium. Did the stadium have an ambulance? What was the, what were the checks that, you know, I, so that we don't repeat, because it looks like when something happens, we shout, you know, hey, ban, ban, ban. Then we move on till the next tragedy breaks. The question I want to ask is why is root cause analysis not normalized in Africa? Because I know it's normalized in other parts of the world. You know, um, why is it a big problem in Africa um, wherein we are just quick to, for example, for everything that is happening, we are quick to say is the spirit of a uh, uh, divorce, is the spirit of, and I'm asking, how did you arrive at this conclusion to know that is the spirit of Bezebo or is the spirit of Jezebel? You know, and everybody keeps looking and saying, you know, why is it that Africans don't embrace science? Or is it that we don't like the work that is involved in digging deep to get to the root in resolving the problem permanently, or maybe we're not even interested in solving the problem. What, in your opinion, is the challenge here? Th thank you. you. You've asked the question, and somehow you've even provided um, a good, uh, veritable response. Um, you know, though I don't support this, but I was, I've read several that if you want to hide something from the black man, put it. <laughs> In a book. A book. And you are done. You have had the privilege of uh, traveling. You are in the train. You see the whites there with their books, reading all through hours. But in uh, Africa, in Nigeria, the reading culture, I think we have to do a surgical operation in that area to improve the reading culture. Um, again, the root uh, cause. Um, we were pained by the events that you cited, but often we have uh, come to understand that our government policymakers, they are quick to rush to action without getting some basic information that will inform their decision. We talk about having information to make informed decision. But when you don't have information, no matter how basic it is, you may not be able to make informed decisions. And because of the Ula Balu, the shouts, they felt the first thing to do is to close down the school. Yes, there was a loss of life, extremely painful, but it equally happened in the stadium, like you said. And there are narratives here that I think in the school came uh, plain to say, maybe it was this that led to the death of the young innocent girl or that, it could have been more understandable trying to uh, not giving the correct information. Recall I talked about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So I think all of this might have informed the action of the government. Why not supporting that in, um, in totality? But you know, in this part of the world, we, 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 we have persons who don't check their blood pressure, who work themselves out, and suddenly, when they collapse, the next thing is, ah, his time has happened to him. Are you, they have finally gotten in. That is the culture in this part of the world. That's the culture in Nigeria. We, we, we are not, um, we don't, uh, what's it called now, in met in public health, preventive measures. We don't deal with preventive measures, rather we want to react to issues. We are. We only always react when the issue comes, we react and then we relax, waiting for the next uh, issue to happen to us. I, I think the basic thing is information. That, that, that does it. Even the root cause, root cause of issues at home is information stemming from lack of uh, communication. You can communicate A, the other person understands your communication as B. 
and may take offense. So you need to explain that, no, what I'm saying is not B, what I'm saying is A. But we are not uh, patient enough to do this. Hmm. And that has led to serious issues at home. We have homes that have been destroyed because one person failed to say, um, sorry. sorry. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Okay, I have um, Ogunfeso Emmanuel. He says he must, he wants to ask his question directly. I was hoping that he would type or he said it might be a bit unstructured. Please, can you unmute yourself, Ogunfeso Emmanuel? Where are you? I'm here. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can Good hear afternoon you. From here. I'm, I'm Emmanuel from Ibadan. Okay. Um, my question is, um, Prof, I must say a big thank you for the lecture. I really enjoyed myself. And um, um, in a long time, I've not, I've not really attended a lecture that looks this simple when it talks about research. And uh, I might be opportune to have been doing research for about almost a day, about about a decade now, and um, you really simplify the process. That being said, um, you mentioned about the fact that um, people that are not very skilled in data analysis could engage um, the service of data analysts when it comes to their research. And um, I, I guess, um, based on my practice with both students and organization, I find out that sometimes, when people collect data um, in line with their objective, if they are not very skilled in research, they might be collecting a wrong data for a study. I might suggest that um, for people in that climb, you can carry along the research assistant before you get to data analysis, um, not just until you get to data analysis, you now request for their service so that you can be properly guided when making your research questions and all of those ones. But that being said, the question I want to ask here is this. Um, Professor, yes. I noticed that uh, professionals on this, particularly on this platform, sometimes come to people like us that um, they're in need of research papers. And how can we um, help those professionals that are not, um, that doesn't have research knowledge per se, let me put it in that way, the, the ethics of research, the procedures for doing research, academic research or for publications, how can we uh, collaborate with such people to write more papers? And what, what will you say to them that they can benefit? Because one of the questions they were asking, like professionals like um, uh, Mr. Presfowe, I have some of his friends that I work with and they will ask me, what will I benefit? I'm not an academic person. I'm not, I don't want to become a professor, but I just needed to find out one or two things about these particular social issues. So what do I need to benefit uh, for doing this? How can this boost my career as a, as a therapist or as a family life practitioner? So uh, professor, I want, us, I want you to help us expansiate on this, what, what do people like that stand to benefit when they do research for either publications or seminars like this, or for every other use that you've mentioned earlier in your, in your teachings? Thank you very much, sir. Okay, um, thank you for the, uh, don't, don't let me say question, the questions. I'll try, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try as much as possible uh, to answer to the best of my ability. Anywhere I miss out, please, you might want to just, uh, remind me. Yes, um, research is a wonderful thing. You, you may not be in the academia per se to do research, uh, but you may want to find out some things and then you don't know how to go about it. The next thing you do is to seek help. Mm, sure. That's the first point. You seek help. Even experts, let me tell you, even professors, we seek help. Uh, for example, uh, I've try to refrain myself from analysis that will take me to sequential equation modeling, same, SEM, or path analysis. And this could be a veritable source of analysis that will just give me a particular table instead of having five, six tables to explain the same phenomenon that those two tools will give me one table. But because I really don't know how to do it, uh, persons are scarce, even in that area. I always refrain from that area. So when we have 
persons like that, the first thing is to seek help. Help from professionals like you. They can even Google it. Say, okay, I have this challenge. I want to go into this study. We can help. If they are on social media, they can post it in. If they are on LinkedIn, it can be posted in. Even on Facebook, you will see one or two persons who uh, may be willing to help, whether to I, I give you advice on the step-by-step -step process of going. That means they mentor you, or they may want to collaborate with you, come into the study, then listen to you, get your research question. Because of their experience, they are able to help you uh, pick the uh, design, research design, the method, how you get your sample, your participants, et cetera, et cetera. What do they stand to benefit? You want to do a research and you're able to accomplish that feat. There is no way there's a satisfaction that comes with that. There's a form of intrinsic satisfaction that comes with that, that you, you, you recognize a problem and you're able to do a study that brought out solutions to that uh, problem. It may not be for promotion's sake, but it's, it brings about some form of personal uh, accomplishment or personal satisfaction, which may make the person seek for more problem because problems are all over us. It's just that we don't open our eyes enough to see problems that we can do research on are all over us. But I will not, I will, I will agree with you how to start, how to go about it may, might be the issue. But they can collaborate with experts, they can seek help, and then they get the job uh, done. Uh, even for data analysts, you mentioned it, yes, when you want to start your work, it's good you quickly approach a data analyst who will look at your instruments, or maybe after you have collected your data, before you start coding, the expert might want to help you in terms of coding, how you want to code so that it will be easier to do the particular form or type of statistics you want to do. If you code wrongly, you may have to recode, and that may take away some resources from you. I don't know if I've been able to answer your questions or questions, please. Yes, you have, Prof. Um, there is someone that says, does internet results affect the effectiveness of researches? If yes, how? Um, does internet results affect the effectiveness of researches? Um, if yes, how? I um, mean, alongside that, you might want to um, add this to it. Recently, with technological advancement, there is a new app called Chat GPT. And I know that um, Chat GPT, a lot of academic um, professors, even in America, are having problems already. I know a few institutions that have clamped down on Chat GPT that it must never be used for any research. Uh, because then they they don't know how to classify plagiarism, you know, um, any longer with Chat GPT. So uh, I just wanted to add that to to this other question, sir. Thank you. Um, every time I go on my Twitter page, it always pop up. I've not explored it at all because I just uh, read through and I'm not. Uh, what let me say? Let me put. It, I'm not just uh, interested, but it's always there on my, my Twitter page. I'll just uh, go over and get to where I'm getting to. Yes, the internet. I always tell my students: be careful of what you want to make do with the internet, because uh, there are junks on the internet. Anybody can put something together and put it on the on the net. But again. Internet is a veritable source for information. I want to advise that you seek databases. There are recognized databases from uh, Agora to ResearchGate to the Scopus uh, data page to this other one in Africa, uh, Justor, Journal of Storage and et cetera, et cetera. If you go there, we have open access materials. That is the one you can click on for free and see the whole uh, journal. And then we have some that are uh, subscriber based. You have to subscribe, whether via your institution or personal subscription to be able to get, you can only maybe have access to the abstracts as much as possible. So that is what the internet does. If you go to the right databases, yes, the information there are credible. But if you just go to Google and you 
type into the search box, what you have there might not be totally reliable. So we have to sound a note of caution there. But of course, that's where we get the materials, the information we need. Just click on the button and you have what you need. But you have to go to the right source to get the right information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, someone is asking a question. Um, okay, so Yetsi Williams is saying chat GPT is allowed in international baccalaureate essays. That's what she's saying with an article. Uh, I know that um, in Australia, some institutions have shut down chat GPT um, at the moment. And I know that um, in University of Austin as well, there's a conversation on um, not allowing students to use it for academic work for now. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, JT Williams, for that. Um, Amala is saying, please, sir, what has been your experience with data collection? It's a challenge for us in medicine. Some are untruthful, some are truthful, um, and some give half truths, which obviously impact the result. I would like to know how it is in your field. Um, let me add to that, sir, because I know that in data collection in Nigeria, many of our people, because we are religious, they even um, they, they complete assessment by fit, right? So where somebody is supposed to show whether their marriage is having problems, the person will go and choose that in Jesus' name. We, I'm not going down, you know, and things like that. So how do, how do things like this, culture, religion, how do they affect research results in Africa? Well, uh, thank you. I, I had to laugh. Because um, <clears throat> you are correct, data, data collection uh, can be a very tricky endeavor. So you have to be extremely careful how you collect your data. Um, uh, are you sure the person did not just? Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to. Are you sure the person did not just uh, close his eyes and take whatever he or she wants to take? Okay, you may not see it, but this is an example of a third fund uh, sponsored uh, research. And this questionnaire is third fund sponsored. This questionnaire is for uh, research purpose. You can see the number of items here. The truth remains, except for professionals, you can't give this to an ordinary person. Once the person looks at this, a four page questionnaire, filled to the brain with questions, they will be discouraged because it's just rather too much and they may end up just picking yes or no, yes or no, as the case may be. That's why we, I talked about cleaning your data. You saw somebody picking that um, male and they were asking of uh, menstruation, the number of days, the, are you a 28 day person? Are you a 30 day person for some intervention? And you are picking. You are a 28 day person. But in the social demographic data, you picked your email. How does that correlate? So that means you are just ticking without going through the items because maybe the number of items are just uh, too much. So data collection can be tricky. You have to be extremely careful. How do I collect? We have battery of a uh, test, test battery. You are dealing with uh, substance abuse. There are standardized skills you can use. You pick that. You may want to do a validity, reliability test to be sure the wordings, the language um, is okay for our own uh, cultural consideration. You can easily do that. That is not whether through test, retest, uh, split half method, just some simple, simple tests to determine whether that questionnaire is fit for use in your so called environment. So it's difficult to do data collection. But in terms of influences, yes, culture has influenced us. You know, in, in America, we have family therapists, just the way we have family doctors. Person, people prefer family doctors in Nigeria to family therapists. In the West, it's family therapists. But here is doctor, doctor, and doctor. Talk to some families about therapy. They say, eh? what do you mean? Me going to expose my family outside to somebody? No trust. So you don't, you don't want to blame them. Then again, is a religious influence. It is well. It shall be well. I confess positive. All of those are good, 
But the reality is, get an expert, talk to the expert. We expect, that's why we use the term expert, a professional. We will use ethical uh, considerations to make sure whatever you discuss, stay within the ambit of the therapy session. So I want to encourage our people, seek help when you need to seek help. Don't die, don't suffer in silence. There are experts around that can help. There are organizations that will help uh, link you up with uh, experts. So it, it, it can be done, but I want to agree with you, data collection is a, a tricky one. You have to be careful and maybe seek the help of experts in doing so. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, Prof, I have one more question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have one more question then. I, I think we'll let you go, sir, so that we don't take your time. <laughs> um, now, I mean, globally, it looks like whatever seems to come out of Africa is not is treated with levity outside of here. Um, I mean, I, and I remember that I had an encounter where they were asking me to take a particular course and I said, no, that, um, you know, why do I need to take it? And they were like, oh, you know, um, this is superior. And I asked them, okay, so are you guys willing to sit down and take our home from Africa? And they said, I mean, the way they looked at it with disdain, and I was like, no, I'm not going to take it because if you guys think that your intervention is actually effective, how come it does not resolve the biggest problem? You guys have one of the highest divorce rates in the world, right? And, um, you know, and so I declined. Now, by doing that, they had to take me more seriously, you know, because I, I had to tell them outrightly that you don't, you know, disparage a people and their culture and their outcomes and their intervention because you just have a very funny idea about Africa. How do we move a way, I mean, begin to push what is ours that we know is very authentic because I believe that Africa has got a lot of solutions that the world can leverage from, that they can use, you know, to solve some of their problems. Now, how can we begin to push, uh, you know, so that our work is acceptable? Yeah, I always say to them that you might beat us with technology, but when it comes to authenticity, you cannot, um, I mean, you cannot claim that we don't have what we have. So from your own experience and as an exposed person, uh, and I, I must say that I don't envy you as a professor because when I know what it takes to be a professor, you know, I just simply run away, you know. <laughs> um, wh what do you think we need to do differently, sir? Well, thank you for this uh, question. You know, um, last week, we had visitors from Malaysia. They came as observers uh, to partner Koren, that is the Registration Council for Engineering, uh, profession in Nigeria, to look at our OBE programs, our engineering. And surprisingly, our motto, our vision is about uh, raising a new generation of leaders. And then our mission talks about changing the narratives of the black man to change the black man, the black man's perception. And these Malaysians raised issue with the dean of the college that persons who see this will think ah, we are being racist. Why talk about the dignity of the black man to restore, that is the time, to restore the dignity of the black man. That why not just the dignity of humans? Again, the chancellor, the bishop, uh, Covenant University, Bishop David Oedipo, we always say it doesn't have to be white. To be to right. Be white. That mm. is a very instructive statement. Uh, when you read my profile, I was fortunate to be in a, a Brown University, one of the Ivy League university, in 2011 for uh, <clears throat> a course on HIV, AIDS, and uh, multidisciplinary perspectives on, on, on health. Uh, I dealt with white persons from various backgrounds who were in clusters. In fact, I led my cluster, but I discovered, yes, there is this systemic racism still going on. Even if they want to uh, say they are no longer racist, they are no longer this, but there's this systemic racism still going on. You are the head of a cluster. You, you see the way some white guys will look at you that, uh, why would they use a black guy? to head this uh, cluster. So it, it, it happens, but it doesn't have to be white to be 
right? We have the same type of brain, the same density, the same gray matter. So why, because of my pigmentation? That's why. Right. So there's systemic racism. But again, in Nigeria, and maybe to some extent in Africa, we don't do what we call action research, mm -hmm. phenomenological research that can, or that may give rise to narratives. Most narratives we don't do. So we wait, we fold our arms until the white man somewhere sits down to write narratives mm. on issues concerning the black man. Mm. This has to change. We have to tell the world our own stories from our own perspective, not mm. a white man sitting down somewhere with his own idiosyncrasies writing narratives about a black man. What do you expect? Mm. The universe will say even Tiwe Reban Loko, that's mm. it. A white man we want to, uh, I'm sorry, permit me to use the term, to denigrate mm. the, the black man. The, there's this superiority complex. Just like you said, why have they not been able to put a stop to their gun issue in America, to mm. the high rate of divorce in America? So we have to start to do our own narratives. Expose our own stories the way we want it to be heard by the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I mean, um, I mean, I love the way you close that, and I love that quote by Papa. It doesn't have to be white to be right. And thank you very much. I mean, you touched on narrative management. Narrative management is a critical part of the course we take. That yes. if you don't sell your narrative, you 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 will be. I mean, I was doing a research on how. They came to divide the world into first world, third world. And I realized that there was no research done. You know, someone just woke up one day and he sold that narrative and the whole world bought into it. You know, so I think we have to be loud enough um, with our own um, story and beat our own drum the highest. You know, that's the only way. Uh, thank it. you very, very much, Pro, for obliging us. And um, I mean, I look forward to doing a whole lot with you. I'm going to be disturbing you a lot, sir. Thank you very, very much, sir, for- Thank you for, for having me. Again, everyone on the platform, thank you. It's a wonderful time. I hope we have all learned. You've learned from me and I equally learned from you for all of, the, all of those questions. Thank you very much. So Mr. Praise for where? Thank you, I appreciate you. Thank I you very much. To continue to move higher and higher. Amen, amen. Thank, amen. You. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. I hand over to Ebun Lomo. Or is it Dima that is coming next? Apple, over to you. Your audio, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Olujide. Um, Professor Olujide is my senior at the university. <laughs> 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 thank you very much thank you we called and you you respond and it's been an amazing one I was, i'm just going to add to um that area of the chat gpt to say that um part, part of the things i think lecturers do is not paying attention to some of those things and i think um if we have some of them in, on the call it's high time we pay attention to this chat gpt so that nigerians can also decide what we want to do as regards that. I have my daughter is in the university and I know there's some assignment they will give them and she'll be like, I've done it. I use chat GPT. And I'll be like, I hope this thing is really, really adding value, you know, to what you're doing. And I think it's high time um, lecturers start paying attention to it. It's a research tool and um, it is easy to navigate. And I also want to talk about um, what um, Professor Lujide and um, Presoem said when we were talking about going back to the root cause, doing a root cause analysis of issues to understand what is going on. I, I remember just before we started this program, I made a comment on the professional group, on the um, counseling association professional group, where um, one of the professor raised the forensic psychology. And I, 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 I agreed to it that, well, somebody is coming up to talk about this. That's for the judiciary to say that we should have forensic um, psychology to say that when something happened, there's a, there's a reason why this person is, be, is behaving the way this person is behaving. Instead of just condemning and putting the person in prison, I think in the Western world, we now use 
correctional center instead of prison. And these are the things we need to start looking at. And um, I don't know, any one of us can eventually meet, you can be part of the um, policy makers. And this is it. Professor Lujide talked about the policies. Who are the, who are the policy makers? What, what level of research have they done? What do they even know, especially in education? They just come and they want, want to condemn what the first person, the, the, the person you are succeeding, what the person is doing. You just want to condemn it and bring in another thing. And so we keep rolling out policies without even checking the root cause to know if those policies will work. It's been an interesting one this evening. I am yielding the mic to Dima. Dima, we have, um, you want to talk about the, the um, family systems engineering course, and um, it's a certification course that is run by the Institute of Family Engineering um, Development. Dima, you have um, 10 minutes to talk about this so that we can have people, we can get people to ask questions um, for people who want to enroll and all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Olujide, if you're still on the call. I'm still here. Yeah, we'll, meet. Yeah, we'll, we'll chat on WhatsApp. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah, Dima, over to you. Thank you, Ebu. Um, thank you, Professor Olujide Adekeye. That was a, a great um, presentation. Um, I learned a lot personally and even started to think about how to implement some of the things you shared, not only in research purposes per se, but also in how we show up in the work that we do. Um, one thing that stood out for me in that presentation was where you talked about um, how we collect data and how we use it about informed consent and you know things like that. So I always say to people, even when you do events and programs and people share testimonials with you, it's important how you use it. So it's not just only in research work. I'm hoping that practitioners are also listening and knowing that you use such testimonials with express permission. And even when you're using it with permission, it is such that it validates the humanity of the person much more than just for social proof. So thank you, that was so spot on for me. So this has been put together by the Institute of Family Engineering and Development. And like Prof said, we have systems, we have strategies, we have things that we have created that is indigenous that we can put out there and stand by it to defend it. So the um, Family Systems Engineering um, Certification course is one of that body of knowledge that the Institute has put together. What we seek to do there is we have studied what makes um, how the effect of how people are engineered in terms of their childhood, in terms of their upbringing, their environment and experiences that they go through. And all of the conversations we've been talking about, you know, uh, root cause analysis, forensic psychology and all that, to say that if you are somebody who is passionate about working with people, individuals to be at their best and working with families, even in this growing trend of the satisfying marriages, families having issues, people being overworked, trying to attend to the behaviors that brought them there without knowing that it's important to understand how was this person engineered. So in family systems engineering course, you would learn not only how people are engineered, but what you can do to re-engineer them to get back to the authentic selves. We also, you also get to understand the different marital formations that um, families have and the consequent um, pros and cons of such and how you can help such families build what we call the dream team. Because it also, the cost will help you gain access to what we call Oyela. And so Oyela would be the, our set of psychometric tools that helps you to analyze um, individuals and families and help to create tailored interventions for them. Because already you know that not um, what may be happening to my family, even if it's the same complaint praise for always family brings up with you, the way you're gonna handle it without both families will be different. But if you don't understand how are we made up? What is our family dynamics? 
What is the individual components in personality, love language, and beliefs of the people that make up those units? You'll just be dishing out advice, and that might end up destroying the people. So I'm inviting us, if you want to get access to professional tools that will not only help you accurately diagnose to as much as 95 to 98%, accurately diagnose what may be going wrong with the people you're working with, and then be able to help them build effective systems that would begin to give them more peace, their families more peace, and you know the society as large, then the Family Systems Engineering Certification Program is what you want to take. Again, because we understand how in-depth it is for you to go through this, we not only take you through um, a 12 weeks program. So this is how it runs. You will get access to the learning portal. The modules have been pre-recorded and are hosted on the learning portal. And then once a week on, on within the 12 weeks, you're gonna meet up with your team and your facilitators to review the content. And we also don't leave you to yourselves. I think I make bold to say that the Institute is one of the first, and if I'm not saying only family life education um, institute that not only takes you through the class, but also gives you syndicated, dedicated mentors to handhold you to master the approach for six months at no extra cost, right? Because we're passionate about families. We don't just want people to come to take the course and they don't know how to do it. All right, so after taking the training, you also get to do your field work, which again, we have prepared templates for you that can help you in going into the community and trying to help people build better family systems. So all of that, right now we have the um, February batch ongoing. And if there are people here listening to me who are in the February batch, Maybe you want to come to the chat room and just drop one or two things, how so far the course is transforming you, transforming your families and preparing you with a rich, robust tool set for the work that you're doing with families. The next stream will be coming up in June and the last stream for this year will be in September. Usually the cost goes for 400,000 Naira. But then for those who are attending the public lecture, you get a discount of 50,000 and you can sign up for any of the two streams coming up in June or September by making a commitment deposit of 50,000 Naira. So if you are able, admin, please drop the link um, in the chat room for those who are interested. If you make a deposit of 50,000 Naira, then you can lock down your slot for the June or September classes at the discounted rate of 350. Other, and then you have you know, time to make up the balance of the payment. But if you don't take that commitment today, then you will have to sign up for the course at 400,000. And I think if you've been here, you've listened to Prof, you understand why it is important that we have an increasing number of family life practitioners. I don't have the statistics correctly right now, but I know that at least we have one family life practitioner to more than like 10,000 families or so. And so there is need for so many people. And if you're here still till this time, then that means that family is important to you. If you also as Nigerian, you were sad, depressed, overwhelmed, or even taken aback by what has happened in recent times in our country, following the elections, following the tribalism, the bigotry, everything, then you should be interested in family systems engineering because that would help you understand why are people acting the way they do and what you can do to help them towards creating a better Nigeria, a better Africa, because I tell you, the family is the production center of the society. And if we can get the individuals in families right, then we can get our society right. Okay, somebody is asking a question. I think I should take that. This is a course you don't want to miss. 
Okay, I think that is someone who is currently in the class. What you get is more than what you uh, what you pay. Thank you, Shwaibu, for saying that. Sandra says the family system, the FSC program is a game changer. FSC, um, Adeniji said FSC has repositioned me to handle many important family issues and save many neighbors having challenges in the marital unions. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone who is sharing their FSC experience. As the director of studies at the Institute, I hope to receive you at the next stream in June or the stream for September. Remember, you can lock down your slot with just a down payment of 50,000. Ebu, it's back to you while I wait to receive many more people joining the network. All right. Thank you very much, Dima. Um, guys, you have heard that. Um, please forget about marketing. You all know what's going on. When we say family, it also encompasses parenting and all. And um, the tool or the family systems engineering tool will help you understand all this. You can check the chat box to see the um, testimonials from people who are in class and people who have done pass through um, the family systems engineering certification course. Thank you very much. Now I move to the announcement. Dima, I've done the first announcement I have here. And that is about the class, the Family System Engineering Certification course. And she's giving you, as a director of academics, she's giving you um, 50,000 Naira discount, right? And saying if you can pay 50,000 now, you book, you, 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 you block your, your slots for the class um, for the next stream that is coming up in June or July. I didn't get that clearly, but of course. The, the link is there in the chat box and the phone number that you can call. Um, so part of our communication, part of the means through which we, co we communicate our research finding is via the conference. And I want to announce to you that the Africa Family Life Delegate Conference happens in, on the 15th of May. 2023. 15th of May is the United Nations International Day of the Family. And so this year, our conference, we, we, we call our conference Africa Family Life Delegate Conference. And it is happening on the 15th of May. This conference is free. And um, the theme for the year is disruption, disruptive formation, the changing phase of family reality disruptive transformation the changing phase of family reality it's a free session it's a free conference and we are inviting you to join us on the 15th of may follow us on the social media at ifed academy on instagram or you visit our website, www.ifedacademy.com. If you do that, um, you follow us on Instagram, you get the details. Admin, is it possible we have the flyer so that um, people can get the detail? The conference is coming up. The details will be shared as time goes on. And that's on the 15th of May. This is celebrating the International Day of the Family, according to the United Nations. And we are having the Africa Family Life Delegates coming in. We have people coming in from um, different parts of Africa. And the aim of this conference is to create a platform where delegates from the continent can come together once in a year to exchange models and concepts and be inspired by the most effective models that families can deploy to create developed families en route to creating a developed continent. Please join us on the 15th of May, 2023. Follow us on Instagram, visit our website, www.ifedacademy.com and you will get the details. Um, another announcement, watch out for our second public lecture, which comes up on the, on the 20th of July. Thank you very much. We have um, the flyer there. African Family Life Delegate Conference. 
9 a.m. on the 15th of May. The venue will be announced to us later. Please follow us on social media. So watch out for the second public lecture, which comes up on the 20th of July, 2023. We will explore the impact of technology on family life practice. We all know, I'm sure, for those of us that are parents here, we know how this has been causing trouble, the use of technology, the impact of technology on our family lives. And so you want to, you want to come here and learn the theme for that public lecture will be the tech disruption and future of family life practice. The tech disruption and future of family life practice. I also want to personally invite you to the family meeting. This is part of the franchise. This is part of the, our way of communicating a solution to people. And so we hold family meeting on every last Saturday of the month. And for the March edition, family meeting comes up on the 25th of March. We're celebrating mother. This is a month for mother. So we are discussing motherhood, bringing in intertwining the challenges and the sweetness of motherhood. Please join us, follow us on, on, this, on our social media and you get all the necessary information to do that. With this, we come to the end of um, the first edition of our public lecture. And once again, I want to appreciate Professor Olujide Adekeye, the, my, yeah, thank you very much. My director of studies, Mrs. Dima Umwobi, and our director, Mr. Praise Fowowe. Thank you very much for all you do for us, the practitioners. I want to appreciate the admin, Amotola. Thank you very much for what you do. We truly appreciate you. And for everyone on this call, thank you very much for always joining. Just like um, Professor Lujide said, it shows that you're interested in how the family runs. And we truly appreciate this. We are world changers. We are global heroes and we rock. Have a beautiful